but we don't see you. I see only myself. Ah, that's because my camera is off. Okay. So can you see it? So now something should be visible. Perfect. Uh, I don't know, Mariam, you want to say some introducing ah. words? Yes. Uh, he hello, dear, dear Jürgen. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for finding time uh, to give lecture on Skype, through Skype. And uh, now we are ready, school participants are ready, and uh, I would like to ask to start uh, this uh, lecture. Okay. Okay. Well, I will then just give this first presentation, and afterwards, Kathy will proceed. Or? Yes. Okay. Okay. okay, so, well, hello from, from Berlin, or good morning. Justified here to say good morning at uh, nine o'clock. Um, what I would like to do in, in the following 30 minutes or so is uh, to present you the first part of the lecture I originally planned to give when I would have been um, in Tbilisi, and um, so that the whole title of the section was evaluation of landscape changes using choice experiments. And uh, what is, does it work with the lights? Yes. Yeah. Do they move? Okay. So this slide just gives you an overview of the four or five parts I have prepared. Um, and we will go through uh, the first two parts, uh, this Y economic valuation. Just a few words about this. And then an example from a project I've been working on many years ago, but it's still a nice way to introduce how these choice experiments can be used. And then there are three other parts, these 10 steps toward the hypothetical market, um, designing choice experiments, and finally, how to estimate those models. Um, those three parts we won't go through today, but um, I, I provided the slides, so, so if you're interested, um, you can go through those slides. And at the end of part five, you'll find a slide with my uh, contact details, my email address. So in case you want to go deeper into this, just send me an email and, and um, ask any questions you might have. For the question why economic valuation or some well, economic foundation, as I called it here on this slide, um, one of the important things is when we do this economic valuation and try to measure people's preferences is that um, a very basic assumption in economics is that only individual preferences count. But when we are interested, for example, in the value of landscapes, we are not going to ask any ecologist as an economist or even not a geographer, hopefully there are not too many in the room, or a, a landscape planner. But what we are seeing as a, a way to measure values is to ask people directly for their preferences. So no experts, but just uh, normal people, so to say. And, and the context we are doing this in is uh, that we are using markets. So in the end, the basic idea is that um, people might also be express preferences for landscape changes uh, as they do it for buying a new car or just go to the supermarket and buy, let's say, a bottle of wine or a piece of bread. Uh, for the meal in the evening. So the market is the core institution that is responsible for providing goods and is also a way to measure their value. And people then can express these preferences through, through two different things. The one thing is that you can just buy something and that you would express your willingness to pay, which means for a certain car, a bottle of wine, you are willing to pay a certain amount of money because that's the maximum it is worth to you. And the other way around is that you can have also a willingness to accept, which means that if you sell something or you're willing to give up something, then you might be willing to accept a certain amount of money in exchange for this and say, okay, if I'm getting this money for this decrease in quality of a landscape, for example, I'm also on my same utility level, so I'm fine with this, and I'm willing to exchange those things. But the problem then with, with markets is that, that many of the goods, and especially landscapes, um, 
are not the so-called private goods that are normally uh, traded on markets. Uh, again, think about this bottle of wine, for example. And then the characteristics of, of private goods are that you can exclude other people from um, using them. For example, if you buy a bottle of wine, of course you can share the bottle of wine with your friends, but you don't have to. I mean, from an economic point of view, you can just say, okay, I, I paid the money, so it's my bottle of wine and I can drink it and I don't have to share it with anybody else if I'm not willing to. And the problem is but that, that these uh, environmental goods uh, often do have not these characteristics private goods have, but are so-called public goods. And public goods uh, are characterized uh, by two things, um, that you can include other people and um, that they are also non depletable. So one thing is, uh, with the non by the way, is this, can you hear me uh, well? Or? Okay, then. Should I proceed? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But because you have a very strong feedback, and it's, it's a bit horrible, so I don't hope it sounds better in your room. Um, okay, so back to the, the public goods. Um, they, they are characterized by the non excludability and non repeatability And non excludability means what we just have with part of what is that uh, you cannot exclude really somebody from visiting a landscape, for example, and joining to you. It might be possible because you can buy uh, or can build uh, fences, but this would be very um, expensive and it's not really doable. The other thing is this non clickability that, that other people not suffer from having somebody else uh, having a view. So if somebody visits the landscape and, and just take a look at a beautiful landscape, uh, nobody else would suffer from this because um, the landscape wouldn't disappear comparing it again to this bottle of wine when you have your first glass. I mean, there's less wine in the bottle, but just having a view on the landscape doesn't change the landscape. So that's what is meant by this non-depletability. And while well, here just the table, we don't have to go through this again, the question whether public or private good. Actually, it's often not that easy to define this uh, because it also depends a bit on, on property rights and for example, as I said, um, with this non-excludability, sometimes it can be achieved if we do a lot of effort, and that might be the case, for example, in an urban park uh, where you can think of that, that all people are allowed to enter the urban park, but at the same time you might have a fence and just have entrance, uh, entrances where entrance fees are collected so that people have to pay for entering the urban park and then the urban park is not a public good anymore, but has been transformed to a private good. So that's often not that easy to define public or private goods. So again, when it comes then to, to markets, um, the, the problem is that markets do not provide these public goods uh, in a sufficient way, because um, it is often the case that, that the demand is, is likely to be higher than the supply. And the reason for this is that uh, if you think about an enterprise, um, again using these examples of the bottle of wine and the landscape, I mean when you produce a bottle of wine and sell it on the market, you will get the price or the money people are willing to pay for this bottle of wine. But to provide the landscape, for example, is, is not that easy then to get money from people who are consuming, who are enjoying visiting it, so that there's not really an incentive for companies to provide these public goods and it becomes a task for politicians, um, decision makers in administrations on to, uh, the question to what extent public goods should be provided. So then the, the economic argument is that, that we at least need some kind of information about how people value 
landscapes or actually changes in the landscape, for example, to make it comparable, the information about the, the value of a bottle of wine to you and the value to you of visiting a certain landscape and enjoying this. And another important thing is, um, and that's often uh, criticized, uh, with the, uh, the, criticized with the economic approach, is that um, economists try to value the whole world and say how much, for example, polar bears are worse and just uh, put a price tag on them. But actually, this is not a question we, we are asking when we are doing economic valuation. The point is rather that we are interested in, in, in certain changes and actually in, in marginal changes. So the question is not how much are all polar bears worse on Earth in, in a monetary terms, but the question is rather how much are people willing to pay from their income, from their budget, to protect, let's say, the next 10, 50, 100 polar bears to make it more likely that, for example, the species will survive. So we do not value the polar bears themselves, but rather changes, for example, in the population and whether people are willing to finance this, give up money from their own budget. And then the next thing uh, you can see on this slide is, is a concept that has been introduced in environmental economics uh, 20, 30 years ago, which is called the total economic value. And it's also, again, something um, easily connected to, to landscapes. But you think it might not only be the view that makes the landscape valuable, but it could also be that there are certain other changes, goods that make a landscape valuable. For example, forests might be included in that landscape and the timber could be harvested from this uh, forest. So that this might be also a component of the total value of a landscape. And so the idea is that um, value of a public environmental good like a landscape consists of different components of value and we can see this a bit better here as an example for aquatic ecosystems on this slide and what we see here is that uh, the total economic value can consist or comprise three different types of values we have the direct values on the left side this is as i just said for example timber from forests or uh, drinkable water or other wild resources that could directly be sold on markets and then we again have a price that tells us about the value of these uh, goods. On the right side you can see then these so-called non-use values. It's a quite, well, maybe strange concept, but your argument behind is that people do not only derive value from a landscape, certain species, for example, by, by using them directly, which means to travel to this landscape to see the species, but also by just knowing that a certain landscape exists. For example, think about the United States and the Grand Canyon or any other very spectacular landscape where people just say, okay, I might never go there, but it, it's very good that this exists on Earth and I'm willing to pay for this as well. That's something that economists call non-use value because there's no direct use connected to their value. It's difficult to measure, but it's an important part sometimes of the value for environmental changes. And then in the middle, we have these uh, so-called indirect values, or they are also called functional benefits, and they are related to certain types of ecosystem services that are provided, for example, uh, flood control or storm protection. And also for those, we can then try to find value in monetary terms. If you think, for example, about that certain ecosystems might protect um, settlements from floods, and then we can think about a situation where um, there's no protection for these settlements and then try to estimate the damage that would take place if uh, we do not have that ecosystems that protect the settlements. So this would give us then a value for that. So the last slide in this uh, 
first section before we go to the example is then um, just to link valuation methods we do have to these different types of, of values we saw in this total economic value and on the left side you find four different um, methods the first one is the so-called travel cost method that means literally people for example travel to a national park uh, or spectacular landscape and for this they have to uh, spend some money for example for, for traveling they have to buy petrol for their car or they have to buy a, a ticket for a plane something like this and this transaction on a market buying a ticket could then be used as an indicator of uh, people's values for this second method is, is uh, hedonic pricing that was developed uh, by arguing that, that when people buy a house, they care about the surroundings. Some people want to live really directly in the center of a city, while other people prefer to live in rural areas where they have um, a lot of forests or lakes in their surroundings. And so that this environment becomes a characteristic of the house. And by investigating differences in house prices, we can get an idea about how important these characteristics, having a forest or lake close to your place of residence, is to people. Production function is um, something where you just think about these uh, direct values, like for example a fish population, you can harvest fish, so the, the lake is then seen as, as a way to produce fish, and you can describe this by using certain functions that relate input to output, and then get an idea of uh, how much these uh, ecosystems might be able to produce uh, with respect to fish, for example. And then finally, we come to the so-called state of preferences, and that's also what we are talking next about. Um, the state of preferences are just uh, characterized, or mainly characterized by the way, that they are directly asked people about their value, if you think about this travel cost method or hedonic pricing, the idea is that um, you can observe something uh, by relating it to real market transactions, as buying a ticket for a train or buying a house. But with state of preferences, we just directly ask people about their values, and there are two different methods. Uh, one is called the continuum valuation. And the other one, the choice experiment, I mean, their main difference is that they prevent the environmental change in question in, in different ways. And the choice experiments do this in a more broad way by using attributes, what we will see in a minute. So they have become, become much popular. And then another thing is um, that when it comes to the value, what you can see in the middle of the slide, um, state of preferences are, in the end, the only methods that can uh, capture both so-called use values and non-use values. So what we had is that use values, you visit the landscape and then um, you have some, some spendings or due to your visit in the landscape, you are willing to give up some of your money. And the other thing is then that this could also happen with non-use values. And you can only capture these non-use values when you directly ask people because it's not really observable. So then we move to this uh, example where we used a choice experiment. It was about valuing biodiversity changes in forests. And it um, comes from a project I was working on many years ago. And the background of this was that um, there was a research initiative by our uh, government uh, where they wanted to know more about the value of biodiversity. So we applied with this project about uh, forest conversion and its impact on biodiversity and wanted to measure the value of, of different levels of biodiversity by using these uh, stated preference methods, uh, which means choice experiments, and in the end wanted to do a cost-benefit analysis for different strategies. So in this slide you can see um, the, the forest conversion objectives. Um, so in this area where we did the study, um, 
there is a debate about forest conversion I mean going from high percentages of coniferous trees to broadleafed trees because uh, it is argued that the broadleaf trees are for example more resistant resilient uh, and can better survive uh, for example dry periods actually in this state we have now after two very hot summers here in Germany again very strongly because uh, many forests suffered a lot so there's a lot of debate now just accelerating this forest conversion also on the national level something that was uh, investigated by us on, on a federal state level in a study region in Germany we will also see in a minute so the basic driver behind our project was that there is a change in the composition of forests and that this might have consequences for biodiversity and we wanted to value those uh, changes in biodiversity. Um, the, the first thing that we did is then we developed different uh, forest development strategies or the way forests could be managed um, in order to, to define different uh, directions uh, the forest development can take. And the first one you see is this long-lasting ecological forest development that was the official strategy by the federal state of Lower Saxony, the area where this project took place. And then we defined uh, other strategies, for example, the third one, this maximum net yield, which very much focuses on getting as much money, you can say, or wood out of the forest. That's something that the private forest companies um, prefer because um, they want to have a, a return as well quick. Uh, I mean, not, forests are not quick, but I mean, they, they are keen on having, for example, coniferous trees because they grow much faster and so they can harvest earlier compared to broadleaf trees, uh, which might take up to 80 or 120 years even before they can harvest those trees. And then there's the fourth strategy, for example, this potential natural vegetation, which would then focus very much on, on having the potential vegetation that would be present without any forest management. So on this slide you can see these um, investigation areas. This is a part of, of Lower Saxony and um, in the north you have an area called Lüneburger Heide where there's mainly pine and in the south an area called Zoning and there you have mainly spruce uh, dominating the forest and the idea of the government, the local government is to change this and to have more broadleaf trees compared to pine or spruce trees that are dominating in these areas. So the survey development was then that, that we first started when we had to talk to, with experts um, to develop so-called focus groups, which means uh, we went to these two study areas and invited people from the general public to discuss with us um, the objective of this forest conversion and uh, impact on biodiversity and uh, well the idea was then to meet people at their place where they live maybe we have this in town hall and to discuss for two hours these topics and to understand how people think about their forest and forest biodiversity here you can see the six locations um, overall 46 people participated in these six focus groups and well, some social demographics which are not so important but, but the main thing here is that um, for these studies it's, it's very important to understand how people think about um, their environments, their forests before you go and, and design a survey to, to ask people about how they might value changes. So this slide just uh, again tells the, the main objectives we had when doing these um, focus groups, questions, I mean, how familiar are people with this topic, do they have any idea about um, biodiversity, would they protest if we ask them to pay something for changes in the forest, so, because here it's, it's actually free to enter a forest and then people are not used to pay for this and might even think that paying for biodiversity is a wrong thing, that it should be protected 
differently. So these are topics we wanted to find out. And the other thing is that we wanted to determine the, the attributes uh, that we will use them later on in the choice experiment. Um, so we presented people overall eight attributes. So you can see four of them on this slide and four on the next slide. Something we discussed in our uh, research team and then also with uh, experts uh, about forests. So we came up with this list of a number of species as an attribute, the percentage of broadleaf forest, forest age class, percentage of non-native species, and as you can see with these um, images, pictograms, we try to just visualize a bit uh, what the meaning of these attributes could be. And then the second uh, part of this uh, list of attributes is on the number of endangered and protected species, the percentage of dead wood in the forest, landscape diversity, um, ranging from low diversity, which you can see on this uh, pictogram on the left, uh, with only three compartments in the landscape, and then on the right side with, with many more different uh, compartments in the landscape, so that the landscape itself becomes more diverse. And finally, then we have the duration of forest conversion, which is, well, in the end, uh, we dropped it. It wasn't not a very clever attribute, but, but we saw people might be concerned about um, how long it takes to uh, change the forest and, for example, whether they themselves will experience the forest conversion, because processes in forests, as many of you probably know, um, really take a lot of time, so this can take years uh, or decades uh, before any changes are really visible. So what we then did in this uh, focus groups is to ask people to think about these attributes. They also received a description for these eight attributes and to rank them for themselves how important they are. And you can see the results here on this slide. We can see that uh, from participants' perspective, it was the most important to have a diverse landscape. Then number of endangered and protected species followed. Forest age class became third with its uh, structure, having trees of different uh, ages, uh, which makes the forest also more diverse. And number four was the number of uh, animal and plant species. So what we did then uh, using the, the ranking, um, as we decided that the choice experiment should have a certain size, uh, we decided to take the first four attributes and use them for developing our choice experiments and um, arguing that based on this ranking, it looks like that, that something like the percentage of dead wood or duration of forest conversion is not that important to people as we saw it in the beginning when we started with collecting these attributes. So a few words about um, the, the survey design or the, the way this uh, project proceeded. Um, one thing is about the market size. We can see this on the next slide uh, soon what it really means, but, but the idea behind it or the, the concept is that the question is um, how many people might be affected from these biodiversity changes in the forest. As, as we just ask people, for example, in their living rooms, um, it is not really clear how strongly these people are related. So you can just people interview who live very close by, or you can just also interview people who are living in the south of Germany, and they might also indicate that they have a positive value for this uh, forest conversion. But actually, just thinking about their own forests and not the one you are thinking about in this area in Lower Saxony, for example. And then the problem with this is that um, this can have a very strong impact on your final results, but because um, when you multiply your results, this marginal willingness to pay, as we will see it in the end, by a higher number of people, then the value of your environmental change easily becomes uh, much higher, and you might draw completely different policy conclusions from this. So we have hired a survey company 
would then draw random samples from inhabitants in certain areas, which I will show you on the next slide. It was the face-to-face -face interview. People went to people, sorry, interviewers went to people's place of residence and then were interviewing people there. On average, this lasted for 30 minutes. They got an information sheet describing these four attributes and also the fifth attribute we added uh, as a cost they would have to pay. We'll see this in a minute on, on a slide with a choice set. And well, eliciting willingness to pay. So when you remember what, what we had in this uh, economic foundation about these two concepts, people can pay or accept, we went here for asking people um, to pay something for have changes and not whether they are willing to accept and get money uh, for these changes in the forest. So people here would have to pay. Then this slide um, prevents the, the, the market size of what we did. Um, when you remember the map with these two study regions, we had uh, one in the north and one in the south of that part of Lower Saxony. And we then decided to, to sample people in the south only for this uh, study area of forest called Zelling, and, and people living in the north only for this uh, area of forest called Minneburger Heide. And then you have um, an area between these two study regions. Um, and here we decided to interview people for, for both the Lüneburger Heide and the Zelling because the argument is that the people might travel to both of these uh, forests in order to um, recreate or enjoy uh, a nice holiday there. So that there is an, uh, this is an argument why they might be concerned about these forests in these areas. So unfortunately this is in German, but uh, it shows the information we provided people during this interview. This was shown them by an interviewer and then they could go through it. It was detailing each of these um, attributes. We decided to have on uh, our choice sets and explains a bit the different levels uh, these attributes can have. And this is illustrated then also by the, the pictograms you can see on the right side of this information sheet. So from this we went then to uh, define attributes and levels, or actually this is a different way to just prevent this. Um, you have already seen the, the levels on this information sheet, sheet for example, by the different uh, pictograms. And here it's just uh, in, a, in a text version. Again, on the left side in that column is the four attributes, habitat uh, for endangered and protected species, species diversity, forest age or stand structure, and landscape diversity. And finally, this uh, attribute which makes it then economic valuation, a contribution to a fund for forest conversion. And then you find on the uh, right side the two columns for these two study regions and the different levels these attributes can have in the study regions. So if you look for example on the first row with these habitats, um, um, we decided in our project back team that as the situation is a bit better in the study region, Lüneburger Heide, the attribute can take here only the two levels medium and high while in the other area it can be also low, medium, and high. And while these, these attribute levels are then allocated or combined to alternatives using a statistical technique and so we want to combine that and in, in, in two, two different alternatives and in the end um, find out which of these alternatives people would prefer. And so this is then the, the step to, to a choice set, as you can see it on this slide. So all the information that was on the previous slide about the attribute levels is then used and, and combined with this experimental design technique to alternatives, as you can see them in the two columns, program A and B. The, the 
program without forest conversion is describing the uh, current or at that time where we did the survey situation in those forests. So this one will always be the same, while the program A and program B forests would look different because this experimental design gives us different combinations of the attribute levels. And maybe one last thing, if you look at this uh, second last row, contribution to fund, you can see that uh, in this current situation you wouldn't have to pay anything, while if you opt for forest A or B, you would have to pay 35 or 20 euros. And this again refers to what we had at the beginning, that we are not valuing what we already have at the moment, but only changes. So for just keeping the forest as it is, you don't have to pay anything. But if you do want to have any changes, then you would have to, to contribute to finance ways, management actions to get a forest that would look like uh, one of these alternatives, program A or program B. And using this um, experimental design technique, we created 36 of these different choice sets and block them into six subgroups so that in each interview a respondent had to respond to six of these choice sets. They were randomized by the interviewer so that the order of appearance wasn't the same for all respondents. And then people had to pick up one of the three alternatives and well actually the one that was then explicitly said they should pick up the alternatives they would or they are preferring the most. So then we come to um, the results section. This map just um, shows you uh, in which uh, cities the interviews uh, took place. So these um, interviews at that time, it wasn't, well, no, it wasn't even possible, I think. Uh, at least it wasn't popular to go for online surveys. So. We were, as I already said, really sending interviewers to people's place of residence. And so they were just traveling to certain cities and then starting what was called that day uh, so-called random walk. So starting at a certain street corner and then walking along the street and um, moving into the next street on the left side and then picking up the house, uh, the first house on the left side, for example. So that's the way how this worked and what you can see on this map is that the blue dots are cities where only interviews for these Lüneburger Heide took place and, and the red dots indicate cities where people were interviewed um, for this uh, Zellen Harz uh, forest area. And on average I think on, in each of these uh, cities 10 people were interviewed but randomly selected them in the cities. Uh, so these were not people living in one household, but in very different households across the city. Um, this slide presents you some of the um, social demographic characteristics of the respondents. Uh, partially they are quite similar. If you look at age, uh, people are 49 years in one and 50 years in the other study region. When it comes to gender, it differs a bit. Um, we have more male in the second male respondents in the second study region than in the Lüneburger Heide. Um, and when it comes, for example, to, to the use of the landscape number of forest visits, um, we have on average more all visits in this first study area, the Lüneburger Heide, compared to the Zellin Harz area where on average people only visited those forests we were interested in. Uh, seven times per year. And well, the last thing we also, because we wanted to find out a bit well, how strongly people might feel attached to this forest, we asked them for how many years they have been living in this study area and also this differs by well, four to five years. As you can see, people in this uh, the study area, Lüneburger Heide, um, been living five years less at their place of residence and those interviewed for the other study region. So when it comes then to the willingness to pay, and this means whether people have chosen an alternative where they do have to pay something, this program A and B, or where they don't have to pay, 
you can see results for this year. And what you find out is um, that, that in the first study region, Duneburger Heide, out of these 301 respondents we interviewed, only 41% picked up an alternative where they had to pay anything. So the other way around, 60% of the respondents said, no, I'm fine with what we have and I'm not interested in forest conversion and at least I'm not willing to pay for it out of my own budget, give money so that we can then change forest management and pay for management actions in the forest. The figure is um, significantly higher in the second study region, but again we have close to 50% of respondents who are also not willing to pay for this forest conversion and are fine with uh, what they do have uh, at the moment or and at that time when the survey took place. So this slide uh, shows you then some results of, of uh, regression models we were running. And one of the ideas uh, is with these choice experiments that the attribute levels people see on these choice sets have an influence on the probability that people go for one of the alternatives. And what we generally expect is that um, when you think of an attribute like, like a habitat for endangered species, that people go for higher quality, so changes to higher or better habitats uh, would be valued positive by people, and that's also why we expect a positive sign for the coefficients we estimate with our regression models. While on the other hand, uh, when it comes to money, people are not so keen to pay more and would like to have the same or better quality for less money. So what we expect here is a negative sign on the coefficient. And that's something, when you look at this um, slide, you can see, for example, for the attribute habitat, which is the first in this uh, table, this HAB, we find in, in different models, but for both study regions, that people value higher quality habitats for endangered species positively. But when you look at this row, which is called font, or which is the, the payment people would have to do, um, you find a negative sign for the coefficients. But they are all highly uh, statistically significant, meaning that, that people go for alternatives that have a lower price and not for very high uh, priced alternatives. So I won't talk about these, these different models. I try to capture whether people are different or not, or whether they have the same preferences. Uh, but that's a detail I think we, we shouldn't talk about now. And um, one of the results you can get from these uh, regression models is, is the so-called marginal willingness to pay, or what you can also find in the literature, it's a name implicit price. It's simply a, a ratio of these coefficients we saw on the slide, on the previous slide for, for the attributes and for the non-monetary attributes like, like habitat or species and the monetary attribute. And so this ratio gives you then the amount of money people are willing to pay for having an improvement uh, by, by one unit. So if you think about, for example, this, this habitat in the Southern Hearts area, the, the second area, we, we find that when we use the model called here ML, that, that for an improvement from low to medium or from medium to high, people would be willing to pay per year six euros ten to have this improvement in, in habitat. And also the uh, second row gives you for the study regions and um, the amount of money people would be willing to pay for protecting endangered species in, in a better way. Again, moving up for one level um, and then people are willing to pay around 10 euros for having a higher amount of endangered, protected endangered species in those forests. So this is then already the final slide. Um, and the nice thing with this choice experiment is that you can 
um, value different management strategies by simply combining the, the attribute levels uh, with, with each other because you do have information about people's value for the different attribute levels. And this well, relates now back to, to the beginning where I was introducing these different management strategies using these choice experiments that allowed us to value the different strategies uh, we defined at the beginning of the project by, by simply combining attribute levels and then summing up the, the money people would be willing to pay for these um, different changes in the attributes. And, and, and finding out uh, what is the overall willingness to pay for having a certain management strategy, for example, in a forest or in a landscape. And what you can see, for example, with this um, column in the middle, uh, with this title, Lube or Long Lasting Ecological Strategy, is that if we would go for this one, assigning those attribute levels uh, to it, then we can say that, that people would be willing to pay around 34 euros per year for this strategy. However, if you go for a strategy that would be called natural woodlands, where all the attribute levels are really on their highest level, then we can see that people would be willing to pay significantly more for this. So they, based on our survey, uh, would be willing to pay 50 euros per year to have forests that would be managed uh, like those described in this uh, column on the right. And that's, well, finally also the, the reason why, why these choice experiments have become so popular. It's not only that you can get information about how people value changes, for example, in the landscape, but um, the good thing is that it gives you more detailed information, which in the end allows you then to assign these values for changes for certain attributes to these strategies so that it gives you some information which is much closer to um, decision making and making recommendations to politicians by saying okay if we follow this strategy it means this amount of money and then you compare this uh, to the costs that, that would rise if, if you follow the strategy because you have to well, plan new trees or compensate private, private forest owners. Okay, so that would be my presentation. I think I've been talking much more than I should have been talking. I hope that was okay. I can't hear you. Yeah, thank you very much and have a nice day. Yes, you too. Bye bye.